Uh, and so the French, as they usually do, um, threw themselves into uh, using uh, skydiving canopies, early early uh, tweaked ones um, to make them easier to foot launch as descent tools uh, for alpinism. So climb a route um, and instead of doing 50 repels to get back down to the bottom, you um, just ran off the hill with your with your glider and flew back to town. Uh, there was a, a notable American uh, married to a French woman over there um, during that time frame, John Bouchard. Uh, uh, and he uh, brought back the first paragliders um, to the US um, to sort of develop the sport here. And in the eighties, uh, I worked for him. And the gliders were pretty simple back then, seven or nine cells. Uh, and um, the performance was pretty low, three or four to one. But if conditions were right, um, you could you know, carry a fairly small lightweight glider up to the top of um, some peak or uh, ridge line and, and pop these things off and, and fly them down. And so when John brought these to the States and started making them, uh, he got, John was a great alpinist uh, during the seventies and early eighties. And so he got a lot of his alpine climbing friends um, to try them out. Uh, you know, fairly famous names from back in the day, like Todd Bibler and John Mittendorf, uh, Mark Twight, uh, all were, uh, early protagonists of paragliding. Uh, and uh, we didn't know a lot, a lot back then and the gliders weren't that good. And so there was plenty of crashing going on um, and, uh, and maybe some successful descents off some uh, pretty good climbing objectives with these things. Uh, and I, it sort of fell out of favor uh, in, the 90s and paragliding sort of headed down the road of race to goal and cross country. And uh, most of the gliders were developed for that purpose and using these things to descend mountains uh, fell out of favor uh, due to the carnage of the early days with the climbing crowd. And so uh, over the last uh, dozen years or so, uh, hike and fly and run and fly gliders um, uh, got much further refined. Uh, lightweight cross country gliders because of the X Alps got further refined and uh, some sub disciplines formed in this sport. And to me, it's almost like uh, back to the beginning. And now um, you've got a host of different type of gliders um, that are uh, more specific for certain purposes uh, that have brought back para-alpinism um, as we used to call it. Uh, and people are doing all kinds of things, combining uh, climbing and flying and skiing and flying uh, and doing some very inspiring uh, link-ups. And so that leads us to um, a, a more structured approach, which is uh, hike and fly races. And um, you've seen this in climbing, ski mountaineering, um, uh, uh, sort of being transformed into a much more accessible uh, sport for a, a wide variety of participants with ski mountaineering races. Uh, and these primarily take place uh, in ski areas or more controlled environments um, to account for um, objective hazards of avalanche danger. And um, it's become wildly popular, uphill skiing. Uh, just like um, mountain running on, uh, and running in general resulted in all kinds of races for all categories of uh, participants, uh, you know, whether it's uh, 
uh, ultra distance, marathons, 5Ks. Uh, uh, it's made the sport accessible and it's also provided um, a gateway into um, the sport um, that's uh, pretty low commitment and a percentage of the people that have gotten into the into running ultimately become you know ultra distance runners or mountain runners and are chasing fastest known times you know like Killian and so with uh, hike and fly paragliding we're hoping that it allows some of the same uh, things and that is um, a much lower commitment um, way to uh, enter this part of the sport um, in a structured environment, um, which uh, uh, you have the advantage of a bunch of people around you and some organization and some support and a lot of weather information uh, to allow everybody to have a good time with this at a few different uh, levels of experience. Um, and I'm hoping that by doing these races, uh, this will be a gateway uh, for people to first have fun and uh, gain some experience and then ultimately um, try their hand at, at bigger races or even just going bull biv yourself. And so the whole idea of this, um, you know, this initiative by Gavin in the States is to expose people to this uh, discipline of flying and um, make it much more easily accessible and, uh, and safer for pilots at different levels, which is why for the X Red Rocks, um, there's three different levels in which you can participate in on um, each ascending and difficulty. Uh, and then doing so in an environment um, where um, you've got uh, a lot more information and a lot more support um, versus doing it on your own. And so, like Gavin said, this is uh, the first webinar uh, for some. I would say virtual orientation on on uh, this event, and you know we're here to uh, uh, answer any questions you have and help you get your head around it. So, Gavin, um, that's just kicking off what we're trying to do here and where this whole um, activity originated. Uh, and then having this be uh, a bit more easily accessible than just climbing something and hucking yourself off the top. Perfect. I'd see Ben, you're here, Walker. I, I, you, if you could uh, unmute yourself and just could you give everybody a little preview? I, I think understanding kind of how we build the tasks will understand. We'll, we'll we'll shed some light on on how it works. It would be, you know, you you Ben is we have a task committee, you all and Bill is on it and Ben Walker and Ben Abruzzo and uh, a couple others, Revis, uh, who's made up all the waypoints for us the last couple of years and we're consistently adding more and more. But we we get together, we got together last year in a big way and created a ton of tasks. And so unlike the X Alps, what we try to do is create tasks that are that are built a bit around the weather that we have. And we try to make them fun and hard and uh, but kind of maximize the day. And Ben has been really integral and and in spending a lot of time on on Google Earth and just identifying where the possible places we could go. So Ben. So just talk, before, talk about that. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Before we get there, um, it'd probably be handy for people to understand if they don't already, um, what a typical day looks like. Mm. Um, and Gavin, either I can do it or you can do it. 
Uh, and so uh, what you have here is a, is a three-day race uh, and, uh, and it's sort of drawing from, uh, um, from different aspects of, of moving in the mountains. Um, and, uh, and I, I like to say that, you know, if the weather's bad, it's an extreme backpacking competition, um, because you're just going to be, um, hiking off, you know, off trail at times, you know, the day starts at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, cause we don't want to, uh, um, get up to launch too early. Um, if, uh, you know, if it's going to be catabatic. Um, in difficult launch conditions because you can have a sizable field. And so a typical day will start um, with a hike up the mountain starting in the morning with all your kit, uh, a, a flight down. Uh, it may be thermic by that point, but maybe not. Maybe you're just hiking um, to a mandatory landing point in the valley, um, having to pack up um, and hike up again. Uh, and any hiking you do, sometimes um, it'll be up a dirt road. Sometimes you'll just have to find your way uh, uh, up the mountain in as direct line as you would like to take. Um, and you're not uh, uh, obligated to take any uh, established route, but there's probably going to be a turn point uh, right around launch that you'll have to be at um, in order to complete the task. I, your second hike up the hill um, after that first sled ride um, will probably involve some thermaling uh, and you know uh, some cross country flying to get to either another turn point um, in the air or on the ground uh, and ultimately to uh, the goal for the day. Uh, and each day um, is, uh, is a separate task, if you will. And so um, you'll get scored um, for how well you did in completing the task or as far as you got along the task uh, for each day. And then you get collected uh, by uh, the meet officials and uh, get some sleep and the next day uh, you'll do it again. And um, you'll, the task committee will try to set some interesting um, tasks to complete uh, uh, based on conditions uh, and, uh, and whatever other factors are at play, strength of the field, um, safety, stuff like that. But uh, there's an effort to make the tasks interesting, challenging, and achievable. And so, uh, so, and with the goal of, of having everybody exhausted and having a good time, um, but not uh, so extreme uh, that, um, you know, you're, you're putting the field at risk. And with the three levels that we have in this competition, um, each level will have a task that is similar, um, but harder. Um, as you get to the higher levels. And so obviously the, um, the pro field will be the hardest and the longest task, um, uh, but we will try um, to have everybody together at the start. Um, and you know, each group will just do something longer or shorter um, uh, depending on the level. And so with if that is relatively uh, understandable, um, we can kick it over to Ben to sort of describe his process of, um, of creating these uh, tasks for the day of which we've um, created many options um, to choose from based on conditions. So Ben, over to you. Already said it all, Bill. Uh, I think the main things to point out when we're designing the tasks are the goals. And we want to make sure we're doing a separate task each day, as Bill pointed out, but we want to make sure that the tasks 
don't feel the same each day, that we have good variety. So that's one of the goals. Another goal is to make sure that we get a good amount of hiking and that the hiking um, is, of course, intermixed with flying and that that flying is interesting, challenging, fun. And then there's sort of an additional goal, of course, which is we're in this extraordinarily beautiful part of the world. So we've designed the tasks as much as possible to take us into some of those most beautiful spots. And it's unique because we have a lot of mountains and mountain ranges that we can fly down or fly across. Some really uh, pretty big and interesting valleys to cross. And then sort of on the periphery a little bit is a lot of classic Southern Utah red rock country. We're right on the perimeter of like Bryce and uh, the San Rafael Swell and some other really neat areas. So uh, we have some tasks that go out into Red Rock Country. Uh, other than the things that Bill already mentioned, I think that covers it pretty well. Unless Gavin, there's something more specific you wanted me to get into. Well, uh, I've got something for you, and that is. Um, crafting the task to have um, a certain amount of structure to it, but also a certain amount of uh, um, open format. So pilots can, uh, can make their own choices a bit. Yeah, that's a very good point. We, we learned a lot the first year that we did this. We had turn points that were reasonably close together, which meant the field ended up with minimal choices for strategy. And we tried to change that with our tasks that we have now, where we still have turn points because you have to, but we, we, we spread them out a lot more and purposely put them in places that would give people choices. So you can pick hiking route. You can pick whether you walk around the mountain or hike up to the top and fly down. You can pick whether you stay um, you know, down in the valley, trying to cover distance on the ground using roads, or take the more circuitous path up into the hills that might give you a chance to fly. Uh, ben Abruzzo is on, and so one classic example is on day three last year, he took a path that was quite different than most everyone else, where he went up onto a mountain ridge and ran down that ridge while everybody else was in the valley. And then at the very end of the day, when a few people were able to fly, he was already at launch essentially because he was on top of the mountain instead of down in the valley. Whereas everybody else who had to fly or who wanted to fly, sorry, had to hike uphill to get to a launch. And I think that worked out pretty well for him, for example. So yeah, this concept of strategy, I think is a huge addition to how much fun these competitions are and just adds a, an element uh, I guess an additional element that each one of us has to consider as we're trying to figure out how best to work our way through the task. And we will have another webinar specific to navigation and apps. And so that, that'll be covered down the road, but the, the tools that Ben uses to create the tasks are things that you'll find become quite handy in your own preparation, you know, using Google earth and getting familiar with how to get up a mountain. And it's, it's when you just show up and you haven't really taken a much look at the terrain, you'll find that it can be a little overwhelming. And if you, if you spend a little bit of time, just kind of getting to know the area and making sure you understand how to use the tools at your disposal, that helps just keep you moving along and because the 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 concept behind the the x red rocks was was very much inspired by the x alps but we really wanted it to be unsupported we want people to kind of be their own uh their own decision maker throughout the race and that comes with, you know, its own challenges, but it's also also its own fun. You're kind of the only one responsible for your success or failure. And that, so that we'll try to cover a lot of the things that will help you succeed. And I would say success is just having a good time and everybody has a good time. So we'll, we'll cover a lot of that down the road, but the, the tasks themselves are, we, we post those way in advance 
all the all the various options they're actually i think still on the website and we won't alter them very much we have we will add more options this year but you can kind of start digging into those and get familiar with them and there's there's codes that go along with each of the waypoint and, and that you know, some you have to tag on the ground others you can tag either on the ground or in the air you can kind of get familiar with that and understand the, the concept of it you've probably all seen the the x alps and this is similar but it, it you don't have the support team you don't have someone you can necessarily ask and the the the, the participants get thinned out pretty quickly you'll find it's hard to just follow someone so there's definitely some thinking involved as the as the day stretches on yeah and i would also say that um you can do pretty well on um, in this race even if the glider doesn't come out of the pack very much, uh, just because uh, we try to design the tasks. So um, uh, you can move pretty well along the course, whether it's uh, in the air or on the ground. Um, you know, the air is better, but the ground still works. And so if you don't like um, the flying conditions, um, the area that we do this race in is pretty conducive to moving pretty fast over the ground. Uh, and on last year's race, uh, I didn't like the conditions all that much. Um, and I, I left a glider, you know, after the first flight down, um, pretty, uh, which was more of a sled ride, you know, right after the first hike. Um, I don't think I pulled the glider out of the bag again on any of the days. I only flew it once to fly down in the morning, and um, it was a little bit too uh, too uh, too much for me. Um, and I was totally content with um, motoring along on the ground uh, because of that. Uh, and and it was fine, and it was fun. And so um, I wouldn't let uh, the flying. Uh, intimidate anyone uh, I, that's considering this race. Um, and when in doubt, you know, don't pull it out. Uh, just, just motor. It, it's worth emphasizing, I guess, two things. First of all, I'll just restate what Gavin already stated. All the tasks are still on the website and they're not changing a ton. Some of the adventure tasks are going to get, um, I don't want to say made easier, but a little bit. They're going to be just a little bit detuned because they're uh, some of them are extremely aggressive. Uh, and 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 then we're going to add a few, as Gavin mentioned. But if you go and you study those and you understand those, you'll be in a really good spot for the race. Uh, and and do it on Google Earth. That's the right place to do it for sure. The second okay. is get really familiar with navigating on the ground through trails and areas where there are not trails using your phone. And if some, some people already do that all the time when they're hiking or cruising in the mountains, some people are less familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it and you don't have a mapping service that you really, really like, uh, spending time this summer to get accustomed to that will pay off in a big way once the race comes around. Personally, I use Gaia. Fat Maps is the other one that people really like. And we'll be part of the academy division. Is we'll be mentoring you all during the race. So each, well, not as the race is happening, but each evening uh, when the task the task committee will meet, we'll put together the task, and then we'll get a little smaller group together and and talk about the next day and kind of how we see it. And that might ne not necessarily be correct, but it'll we'll, we'll tell you what we think and, and kind of some strategies and that kind of thing. So we'll we'll kind of hold your hand through it and, and that will hopefully help you kind of visualize. But like Ben said, getting familiar with the terrain and kind of visualizing how you might move through it uh, can be really handy. And we, Part of the video from last year did a really good job of that. It showed the task and it showed how people did it. But we've got all those track logs, so we could put together we could put together some of those as kind of a specific. This is how it was done in a future future webinar. 
Should we go to Q and A, Bill, or do you have yeah. anything more to say? Oh, I, one more thing is we also do supply. We because it's unsupported, we have resupply stations, and so there will be at least two, and it depends on the length of the task and how we kind of see the day going down. But you will know where the resupply stations are, and then you can also elect to. Uh, you know, hey, I need some help. I need some stuff. And we can't promise that we can get stuff to you, but we can, we will try as the, the organization. And that's me and, and my staff. And we'll, you know, we'll try to get to you. But the there will be official resupply stations where we have a lot of stuff, you know, good food and good energy stuff and lots of water and electrolytes and that kind of thing. So we try to make, that doesn't mean you can go out into the desert with one liter of water and no food, that's not going to work, but you, you need to be thinking about how you're going to fuel yourself through the day, totally independently of us. But we do have resupply stations that uh, we have found are pretty important because you are in the desert. It is really high. The days are long. So questions. Well, Kirk, yeah, I noticed on the site first. that when clicking on some of the tasks from 2022 to look at, everything says not found. Mm. I was afraid of that. We might have, to, you know, the, the links go to, we, we, Revis builds those through X contest and, and they, I think they expire after a month, but Ben, you'll have to, we, we might have to just uh, do your versions until before the race. You remember that? Yep. Uh, I've got stuff that I can share over. Okay, we'll we'll take a look at that in the next week and and put those back up. Thanks for checking. I was afraid of that, but the we'll we'll put all those back up because we've kind of got, I think over twenty now. You know, is that is that about right? Still, Ben, we had about twenty tasks that are for both pro and adventure that we choose Sounds from, right. and then then the weather can can dictate some some changes. I have hey, another God. question about oh. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask, um, can you give us an insight into sort of the legal side of land ownership out there? Like if we were to want to take a trip over there in the summer to get a sense for those mountains and what hiking in them is like, uh, can we do that? Or is it like only allowed during the race period or something? Oh, I would been... say it's uh, mostly the Wild West. Um, and it's pretty unrestricted. Obviously, if you see some no trespassing signs piled up, you know, give it a give it a wide berth. There'll probably be some fences. Uh, I would say that uh, you can, you know, between the dirt roads and just the total open country, you'll be able to go most anywhere. Um, but it's it's common sense, you know. You, you kind of know what places to avoid compounds with fences around them and a bunch of no trespassing signs. You just go around those. For um, sure. I wasn't sure if you guys had like some special access going on for some properties or anything weird like that, but that makes no, sense. No, um, it's, it's not a highly populated area. Yeah, Wesley, I don't know where you live, but Utah has the largest percentage of federally owned land of any state other than I think Alaska which what that means is federally owned land is almost generally always accessible. It's BLM and Forest Service. And so you can pretty much go everywhere. Cool. There, there well, I'm on the front range of Colorado, but it's close enough for me to get out there sometimes. So come see Yeah, it. there are a few exceptions in the valley where there are fences like Bill pointed out, but once you're in the hills, it's pretty much accessible. Yeah, I have a, a question. Um, it might be obvious to you guys, but I'm coming from the other side of the world. So uh, how's the weather? How cold it is? Should I prepare to get, you know, very cold flying conditions or is it just halfway or mild? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it can get quite cold. Um, and you're also at altitude. So we'll be hiking up to over 11,000 feet. Uh, and so some acclimatization, um, if possible, is a good idea. Uh, you'll feel better, you'll perform better. And uh, uh, if it's post frontal, it'll be in September. So late in September, the nights get cold. 
Um, I, if we have a weather system move through, you know, you could be starting the day with a down jacket on. Um, and as the day gets warmer, you'll take it off and be hiking in shorts. Um, flying wise, we could be reaching uh, 15, 16,000 feet. Um, so pretty high. Uh, pretty high. Um, can be quite cold up there. So some lightweight down pants and some uh, uh, yeah. uh, lightweight down layers uh, are in some warm gloves are recommended. Thank you. For, this, this part of the world too is less prone that time of year to, you know, to overdevelopment and thunderstorms. Although last year we had very active weather. We had a uh, hurricane brewing off of California, which is kind of unheard of. And we had a couple in the Gulf and it was getting all the way up to Utah, which is pretty unusual for that time of year. But uh, we definitely had some pretty wild weather. And so you'd, you'd want to be prepared for some wet potentially as well. Typically not, but you can get some afternoon showers still that time of year. And, and like Bill said, it can be, if we have a really proper day of flying, it can be very cold if you're up high for, you know, any length of time. All right, Brandon, you're muted. Yeah. Hey guys. Sorry. Um, so there's a couple of Canadians in here and just last year we had the Willie competition in gold. And unfortunately there was a complication with going cross country with an American pilot. I'm just wondering for going cross country with the airspace and having things counted, uh, do us with Canadian categories coming down and getting the, the Ushba kind of rating, do we need something special down there for, for flying cross country in the U.S.? No, it's all good. Okay. I'm hoping we could change that one day in Canada because it would be nice to get some of you guys up here. But, uh, yeah, it was unfortunately a big headache last year that we were a little embarrassed about. But, yeah, thanks. No worries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry again. Uh, do I need a Ushpa mem temporary membership or some kind of yeah You'll local registration? I have the 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 EPPI yeah. card, the international. It it'll all it's all very easy. And the nice thing about this is it it happens the same week as the Red Rocks fly in, which is the biggest event fly in 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 the states by far these days. And so your registration will be handled by Quasa, which is the club there. And those of you who are out of country will, will get a 30 day temporary Ushba license. I think it's $10. And then you'll get a, uh, a Quasa club membership, which I think is free. Uh, it, it's sponsored by us for, for the, for the event. So those two things are, you sign a piece of paper and, and that's pretty much it. It's it's uh, so just bring your license. We sure. we do we do highly encourage everyone, and that's people in the states too. To we don't make it mandatory, but we encourage everyone to have insurance. And there will be information that'll come out regularly between now and the race on on what we recommend. And you know, Global Rescue is our is our sponsor. They're terrific. But uh, and highly recommended. But the, we just because this is a remote place, and you know accidents can involve uh, pretty pretty exciting getting people out. And but the nice thing is is we have uh, connections through the community up in Salt Lake. Bill Beninati and uh, Justin Grisham will be will be running our safety. And you know, Bill runs all the helicopters in Utah. <laughs> he runs that whole crew. So, uh, you know, we we will have excellent access to uh, emergency services, which is terrific. Yeah, and just just like in Canada, there's large areas with no cell coverage, uh, and so the uh, satellite trackers with texting capability are the means of communication. Uh, out here in the deep. Uh, so, and with that, uh, Dave Preston has a question. Yeah, I, I think it was Ben mentioned earlier, there's a couple uh, apps that he uses to navigate with on his phone. Uh, could he say those again? And then to your point, if there's not cell coverage, do they work offline? 
Like you download local. Download the maps. Yeah, so Gaia uh, and Fat Map, I think, were the two. Is that G A I A? I think it I've is. That. And I'll, I'll 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 type them into the chat. And and we'll also cover this too, Dave, in, in a in a in a future webinar as well. Get you everybody real up to speed with with how all that works. Ben Abruzzo is really a super pro with that, and as well as well. So. Uh, both of them work better with the upgraded subscription. I think, especially downloading maps. I think Gaia Professional is is quite a bit more robust than just the standard Gaia out of the box. But they're 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 terrific. They're required. The other thing I learned from Dave on the on the Alaska trip was, you know, you can cache uh, Google you, with the Google Earth app. So not just Google Maps, but the Google Earth app on your phone, you can cache maps. And that's a really quite a nice way to get a visual representation. You can also get satellite downloads now on Gaia and I believe Fat Map. So it works. But the uh the Gaia is quite, you know, if you're if you're used to sorry, Google Earth is if you're used to Google Earth and using it and zooming and moving and everything around on your phone, that can be quite useful as well. We we use that a lot in Alaska. So I, I should say too, before we leave the inReach subject that everyone is required to have an inReach. That's not an optional. So if you don't make sure you do, I just got word yesterday that Guy, uh, Garmin's going to sponsor us again and move everybody to two minute tracking. So, which is terrific. So we'll use the kind of the same live tracking that we had last time, which worked brilliantly. It was fantastic. So. But we'll we'll cover the apps in more, way more detail in a future webinar because they're that's that's a whole behemoth that's a big one. Would and one last spot question. work? Sorry, sorry would kind of... spot? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, spot will work, um, but I don't think you have the text. Yeah, I guess it depends on the spot plan and the spot you have if you have texting abilities. Yeah. <clears throat> Joao, if you if you can go to inReach, we, we have they're just far far superior. You'll 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 really like it. Um, Spot does work. I think with Spot Connect, you can do the the texting, but we have not had much luck with that. It just gets really tough, especially in a situation where we need information from you and vice versa. You know, they're fine for tracking, uh, which is typically all we need. So. Uh, yes, it, they do work, but in reaches are quite a bit more robust. I'll get an in reach. On the so one more question about the actual task. It sounds like you could be running a lot, and there's a resupply zone. Did you say we would provide the drop bag, or you provide the the resupply, or is there an option for either? Great, great question. It's actually both. So you all can give you a, a drop bag to me at the first thing in the morning and I will have it at the first resupply for sure. After that, then it gets harder. So we will identify at least one major resupply, but this year we're really going to try to have two along the course line that are in obvious places. They'll be at a waypoint. They won't just be a random spot. So you can, you can put whatever you want in your resupply bag and I will have it at the at least the first resupply. But then we will also have resupply stations along the course line that have various sundries, you know, more water, more food, more shade, all those kind of things. So uh, the, the purpose of that is that the first hike can often be pretty big and a lot of vertical, and we don't want you to have to carry, you know, six liters of water, which is what you would at least carry for a full day in the desert uh, on that first hike. So the first hike, you can kind of go light because I will be at the first launch and, and everyone has to come to the first launch. So you can go pretty, pretty thin for that first one. After that, then we highly encourage you all to load up because you may not see anybody again. Okay, Adam Gordon. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys, for putting this on. Um, so short of spending time down there, my question is, how would you recommend we hear our laptops get our, get to know the lay of the land? Is it looking at tasks and waypoints from previous races? Is it looking at maps? What tools would you guys use? 
Dan, you want to take this one? Yeah, I would. I think you basically answered your own question. Um, once the tasks are reposted, I would dig into those with uh, as much time as you have using Google Earth. And then the other thing that uh, you could do, and I would need to look to see if this is still available, but after the, each race, the results get posted. And those results include the um, IGX file that you can load into Google Earth. So you could pick, you know, maybe the people who got first, second, and third in the pro category and first, second, and third in the adventure category and just see what path they followed, the strategies that they selected, and do that also right in Google Earth. So Google Earth, I think, is the most powerful tool for that. Um, if at any point in time you had a chance to get down there to fly and just get a sense for the lay of the land, I think that would also be really helpful. Thank you, Ben. Um, I don't see those results files up on the website now. Is that something that maybe could be shared? As, oh, never mind. There they are. You can go check that out. Thank you. Yeah, the, I was just going to say uh, the I could check in with Aaron, our our scorekeeper, and and make sure those replays are are still available. But if you look under the yeah, the results, I can't remember what that is. They, they should have them all. And and there's also screenshots, I think, you know, as, as the races go by, I try to put those up as the race kind of develops so you can learn something from that way. But for sure, those there's a replay through Aaron's scorekeeping system that's pretty nice to watch. Uh, I, I don't know if they're buried or still available, but I'll check in with Aaron. I've got that in my notes to check in with him and we'll make those available. Thank you. Okay. Um, they're on XC Demon, Aaron's website. Wicked. Cool. There yeah. you go. All right, Mark. Yeah, I just had a question about uh, altitude. So you mentioned that, you know, on a, on a good day, we might be reaching 15, 16,000. Um, so my question would be the, the use or requirement to carry oxygen with us. Is that something that folks did in the last couple of races or... Are most people not flying with it? No, I would say no one wants to carry it. Um, weighs too much, and so I would um, I would try to acclimatize um, if possible, um, so uh, it doesn't affect you as badly. Um, but certainly, um, you're going to feel the altitude, especially if we get up to sixteen. There, there is Mark. There is no requirement for sure. I mean, you you could certainly, you could certainly bring it and use it. I mean, oxygen helps a lot for warmth and all kinds of things. But most people just don't want to carry it. No, fair enough. That was that's the answer I expected. Awesome. Senna. Uh, hi, I'm curious. Um, is there a requirement to carry our like flying gear? every day, all day with us, if it's a completely unflyable day? And like, could I just go out with a running bus or is it something that we're required to have with us at all times? I would love it if that was true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, the this is covered too. The, the rules are actually, they're on the website and they're good to just have a go through because uh, it, it talks about a lot of that. Most of it we stole directly from the X Alps and the Iger and a couple of other races. So they're, they're pretty similar. Uh, you do have to, you do have to keep your, basically your minimum kit, you know, helmet, instruments, in reach, harness, wing uh, with you all the time. So that's, that's part of the requirement. What's, you can also end whenever you want. We don't care. Uh, you know, you don't have to go until the last part of the day. Uh, that's completely up to you, but you do have to carry your stuff. We are going to add some ultra running and other components to this race. We hope in the future, not this year, but down the line, you know, mountain biking and ultra running and that kind of thing. We, we, this is an amazing place. We'd love to add some of those components, but for now it's just hike and fly. Any other questions? For anybody who's interested, I dropped the link for where you can get the results from previous races into the chat. 
those those were I highly recommend going through those because we had in the first year we had really good flying conditions and you can see the results of that uh, in those in those results and last year we had really really tough weather and we did a lot more pounding a lot more ground game and so you can kind of get an idea for what we're trying to accomplish is both you know the, the task committee and trying to create fun things and you know we're we're going to try to get you in the air as much as we can but sometimes the weather just doesn't play ball yeah and i would uh i would say don't underestimate the physicality of um this race and if you're not training already, get started. Uh, just because uh, the better trains you are, you know, the more fun you're going to have, the better decisions you're going to make, uh, and the better you're going to do. If you all do Ben's Ben's program, I guarantee you're going to have a lot more fun. He will he will prepare you really nicely for. Uh, you know, the, the generic one he's putting out is great. And if you want to really, really go for it, just have him do personal training for you. But he trained me for all my X Ops campaigns and it just, it's, boy, it's worth, worth doing because it just makes it fun and not painful. Uh, Gavin and Bill don't quite get this. And I used to not when I lived in Utah, but I live at sea level now and the altitude the first time I did this was absolutely crushing. There's There are mountains that you hike to that are 13,000 feet above sea level that you hike to the top of. And some of our tasks have like ridge runs along some of those, uh, you know, 13,000-ish foot ridges and peaks. Um, so what I did last year is more cardiovascular training and then I, went and, and basically lived in Utah for about a week and a half before the race. And it helped a lot. For sure. You could, you know, Aaron Duragati won last year. And what he did is he went to Pakistan for 40 days before this. So I would recommend going to Pakistan <laughs> into the high Himalaya and then flying 300 K triangles as much as you can. And you'll be, you'll be set. You'll be fine. <laughs> Simple, simple task. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Wesley, you had a question there? It's probably addressed in the material already, but remind me what the accommodations are around there in terms of like car camping and car camping. Uh, yeah, so yeah, good question. There's there's quite a few hotels, you know, your, your kind of standard hotels down in Richfield, which is about 10 minutes by car from Monroe. Uh, Monroe has a host of really nice Airbnbs. They can start to get booked pretty quick, so you'd want to you'd want to get on that if you want to do the Airbnb thing. And then there's uh, an RV park right next to our LZ that's great and has showers and it's gravel. There's not a lot of grass, but it's the host is terrific and that's the good spot. And then we have a a little campground that we use for the awards and that kind of thing just up from the main LZ called Pete's Place. But I can't promise that's going to be available for camping right now. There's we're, we're still working on that, but uh, it, there's also mystic hot springs. There's several other campgrounds too, that are, that are all very nearby. So you, you've got whatever you need. We come back, we start and end every day in Monroe. So we may take everybody to a different zone for a, a, a particular task. We did that last year, but you don't, you know, the closer you can be to Monroe, you're, you'll be all set. You don't need a car. Anybody else? Anyone else? This can't be it because we're going to actually end on time. <laughs> that was perfect. Uh, just to plug, I think Ben's got his uh, on the whole physical side of things and training this Sunday at 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain. You should have all received the link for that. We'll keep putting these out uh, all the way up to the race. And so keep watching that the Telegram group. I see everybody's joined that now. So we're, we did well there, but 
we will announce these on the telegram chat and also in the newsletter that you all hopefully are getting so and then if we're not hitting something or you want to hit you know you want to see something covered that you don't see in the lineup just let us know yeah gavin if you could send me that link to ben um i don't think i got it okay yeah you know what he did that to, you're right bill he did that directly just to the academy participants and the people we know that are taking the thing but i'll put that out in a newsletter so so everybody has that and i'll put it you know what i'll just put it on the telegram channel i'll do that right now it's the x red rocks official right that's the one yeah we'll, we'll put everything we'll put everything on the official and the chat we'll put them on both what's the name of the chat one uh, x red rocks chat i think it's uh, there should be there. There's a link to it in that one of the one of the newsletters I just put out. Okay, and there's an, another one called the X or Official Red Rocks Wide Open. No, that's that's the Nationals, which is two weeks before this one. So it's it should be X Red Rocks Chat. Okay, hold on. Yep. And if 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 you go back to not the most recent newsletter, but the one before that, it'll have it. You'll have the links for that in there. <clears throat> I should just grab it right now. I'll put it in the chat here. Okay, I'm just putting it in the chat now. Oh, whoops, that's, that's not it. That's Bel Belcourt's email. <laughs> there we go. And I'll put in Ben's thing here, uh, just on our chat real quick. Bill, here you go. There's the registration for Ben's deal. I just put it in the chat there. Great. Make make sure Aaron back gets it too. He could use some training. <laughs> you got it. Ben, are, are you on here, Rizzo? Yeah. Yes. Do you, do you want me to put the link to that in the official in the chat, or are you trying to keep that more... No, I want everyone to be on it. We want the Academy guys to like make sure they're on it, but anyone who wants to come would be great. Okay. There we go. I'll just put it on the chat and sweet. Oh, oh shit. That's not what I wanted to do. Damn it. <laughs> did, you, did you put anyway, today's on there? I I just put the telegram, the, the chat thing. How do I delete this? Jeez. Oh, anyway. But uh, I'll put that up on the chat in the in the official for Ben's talk. And then uh, anybody else have any other questions? All right. And hey, Gavin, are you going to talk about uh, in some of these future ones, kits? Yes. On equipment. So you're going to cover that in the future? Yeah. Yep. Definitely. We miss anything? No, I think we got it. All right, everybody. Thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you.